Ah, now it's starting. Yep. Hey, look, it's starting. It is indeed me. <coughs> Great start. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We'll be doing a Georgia Tech lecture, um, high school lecture, but also we'll be um, catering to some Georgia Tech students here. Uh, the topic of today's lecture is going to be dynamic programming. And we're going to focus on how to solve dynamic programming problems, recognizing the dynamic programming problems. But first, we want to dispel myths about dynamic programming problems, which I think is really important for us to understand. So just as a um, brief, I guess, background in terms of what dynamic programming happens to be, it's a technique, it's an algorithmic technique for figuring out how to solve certain classes of problems. So there, um, so it's, it's just a one methodology amongst many that dynamic programming problems is trying to solve. And we want to fi sort of figure out how to sort of, you know, uh, get to that solution. Now, be before we even get there, we want to talk about why it's useful. So from a programming contest perspective, it's very useful because it's, it's considered one of those medium slash hard problems that you often see in terms of uh, contests. So for example, in the Southeast Regionals, the contest right before the international competition, of the 11 problems there, six of them had some kind of dynamic programming slant to it. So if you were some kind of master of dynamic programming, you could solve a lot of problems. And in fact, seven problems took you to worlds. So just to emphasize how hard and how, how important these problems are. But I feel like there's also this kind of mystique that surrounds dynamic programming, right? Because it's like a really heavy-handed word. It can turn exponential algorithms into polynomial time algorithms. It, it must be like really, really cool, right? But I think that's one of the problems of dynamic programming. The only reason why they called it dynamic programming was so it could sound cool. Literally, that was the, uh, the, uh, per the designer's intent for the thing. So we want to sort of dispel that. In fact, dynamic programming is kind of ugly. It's almost brute force in a way. And if we can see that in terms of its construction, then maybe we can start beginning to recognize and understand why it is that you know, we use dynamic programming. So I think the uh, first thing that I want to harp on about Denon programming is it's actually really intuitive in terms of how we set the program up. And of course, the classic example for Denon programming is Fibonacci sequence. So um, as most of you know, the nth Fibonacci sequence is a recursive function that takes in the sum of the two previous Fibonacci sequences where f of 0 equals to f of 1, which equals to 1. Or there are some variations where uh, f of 0 equals to 0 and f of 1 equals to 1, depending on uh, which indices you want to start at. But we can work with this for now. So there's multiple ways to calculate um, to the Fibonacci sequence. So one of the most straightforward ways to do it is say you have this function, erase, erase, erase. So you have this function, f of n, right? And let's say it returns an int. Actually, let's return a long, because these things grow really quickly. Right. And then we can just simply have it recursively call, right? If, of course, recursively call return f of n minus 1 plus f of n. Right, and then we have to make sure in all recursive functions that we create a uh, exiting condition. And so the exiting condition is where if um, n equals to, if n equals to zero or n equals to one, then return one. Now this is basically the straightforward way of calculating the Fibonacci sequence. The problem with this is that it this function actually grows really quickly in terms of in terms of n uh, does anyone here know uh, roughly at what complexity this grows at it actually grows at the rate of the fibonacci sequence <laughs> um, proportional to that and uh, the fibonacci sequence is uh, just just for fun, just for people who want to know how big it gets, right? It's uh, n over e to the n times square root of 2 pi n. And so this sort of blows up really quickly. It's almost n to the n in terms of its complexity. So it's 
worse than 2 to the n even. And so you really don't want to do that many steps in terms of n, right? So if you, you implemented this function, then you will have a big O behavior that's similar to the rate at which the Fibonacci sequence grows. And it's a really ugly function. So instead, we can leverage something called dynamic programming. But I think the reason why we have dynamic programming comes from the original intuition that, um, that we only have n different numbers that we're calculating ever, right? So we go from f of n, and then we calculate n minus 1 and n minus 2. But when we calculate n minus 1, we also have to calculate f of n minus 2 and f of n minus 3. But then you have to recalculate that there. And that just seems really, really inefficient to have to do all these recalculations. And that's all dynamic programming happens to be, right? When you see repeated work over and over again, sort of break, it, break the problem down into different parts and sort of try to re-remember them as you go along. So one way you can do it, one way you can change this function around, um, sort of make it prettier, is instead of making a recursive function, we can sort of just keep all the information so just create an array of logs of, uh, say, data, or what's called SDIV, right? Um, and make this a new uh, new log of size n, since we only need to figure this out. Um, so the size of n. Um, we're going to say, say n plus 1, because what we ideally want to be able to do is to have Fib, have fib of i return the i Fibonacci number, right? And if we declared it to the size of n, then we can actually figure out n because the array indices will be from 0 to n minus 1. So we want to declare that n plus 1. And then we want to say we want to make fib of 0 equals to um, fib of 1, which equals to 1. We're going to declare that. And then we can just do a simple for loop. For int i equals to 2, since we just started 2, since we hard coded 0 and 1, right? i is less than fib dot length i plus plus. And then we simply just start saying fib of i equals to fib of i minus 1 plus fib of i minus 2. And this will solve it in linear time, which is a lot less than n to the n times. Just, just for a, uh, just to see how quickly each of them grows, right? So we're just going to do for fun, say, for n, right? This is linear. Uh, for uh, something like n to the n, we have something like 1, 4, 27, 64. Yeah. Uh, this is way too big to calculate off the fly. So um, it's like 6,000 something. I don't know. But it, it grows a lot quicker. And the behavior is really, really ugly. Um, so where when you get to 100, you have 100 to 100. And that's, uh, that's one with 200 zeros behind it, which is bigger than the number Google. It will, in fact, be in fact a, a Google Google. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so, so basically, again, this is just the notion of doing repeated work over and over again. In fact, that should seem very obvious. Now, one of the difficulties in terms of dynamic programming is that people seem to not be able to sort of see that pattern or be able to recognize it. And so that's sort of where the mystique comes about. But I, I, I guess to give you another example, right, if I, if I wanted to ask you a simple problem, I'm just going to make this problem up on the fly, right? Now, we have this function t. Right? And it, it does some random math, right? And then I want you to return me the sum of a range of all the t values, right? So if I say all the sum between the range of 4 and 6, right? You can just do t of 4 plus t of 5 plus t of 6, right? 
And I'm going to ask you to solve this over and over again with different ranges. Right? If you sort of pre-computed all the values that you sort of need to consider, or memorized, or memoized, as dynamic programming calls it, all the different values, then in essence what you've done is a dynamic programming problem. Right? You pre-computed everything, you stored it in memory somehow, and then you sort of add them together and re-access it over and over again. So you don't have to calculate the same values over and over and over and over again. Again, that's all dynamic programming is. It's not that elegant. It's just simply recognizing when there's repetition and cutting down on that repetition. So uh, I guess we can move on to, uh, do we have any questions? OK. And dynamic programming happens a lot just because it's a very fundamental principle of you know, saving on basically computation by not doing things over and over again. And so, um, of course, it gets harder once you abstract to different kinds of problems. But for example, I know uh, the high school lecture definitely had uh, graph algorithms. And I know, I believe most of you had uh, basic graph algorithms. Dijkstra's algorithm is famously dynamic because at every step, right, you sort of pre-compute to figure out where the next node has to go, right? You sort of sort of try out all the different ones that it's visited before, right? And you store those values, right? And then you go here. And then when you when you try to figure out this one, you already pre-computed all these values. You're, you're storing them, and then you figure out the new length, right? And then from this pre-computed collection, you try to figure out the next additional path that you add to it. And again, this whole pre-computation storing and then updating it by one, um, that is, in fact, dynamic programming. So um, I guess we're going to go over some of the more classical dynamic programming algorithms sort of as examples. Um, and, just, and I think instead of emphasizing on its elegance and the time it saves, I'm going to emphasize how inelegant it happens to be to sort of get you an appreciation for what dynamic programming has to offer. So this is a classic problem. Uh, this, oh, I guess the other important thing in industry is dynamic programming is sort of applicable in industry in real life. Um, so I guess it's useful to know from that perspective as well, even outside the competition setting. And plus, it's probably pretty cool to tell your employers that you know dynamic programming as opposed to you know normal programming. Or I think the more interesting one these days is the existence of extreme programming. So you could do extreme dynamic programming for your job, and these are not made-up terms. Um, so anyways, so the classic one is, let's say you're in an industry, right? And you're trying to sort of maximize profit as all greedy corporations do, or, you know, good corporations do. So we have this uh, piece of wood, right? Or metal, or some material, right? And you have fixed prices of fixed intervals for them. So you have like this table right here, right? And it says, it has a length, right? And that has a price. And these are all fixed intervals. So we're going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then these are just going to be P1, P2, P3, all the way to P10. Right? And what you're trying to do is, given a piece of wood of size N, right? and then we'll have the table go up as far as N. Right? So this will be P of N. What is the most profitable way that you can uh, sort of split this piece of wood? And so, uh, yeah, we're just going to start observing this problem. First of all, we're going to see the other, uh, the other common approach that isn't as dynamic is this notion of a greedy solution, right? And I think one approach that a lot of people are going to do intuitively when they see this problem is to try to sort of maximize the, uh, the price per unit length right, and try to greedily take from this piece of wood chunks that are most valuable per section. And we're going to sort of see why that fails. So why it necessitates a, a dynamic programming solution. And so, so we're going to have this notion of P over L, right? And then to, to sort of formalize this notion, um, let's say uh, at the price of eight, right, the unit price is like two, uh, 200 or something, right? And it's really expensive for the block of eight because, you know, you need specific sizes of wood to fit for specific sizes of things. So um, 
say that it's, it's really good there. And so basically the ratio between PNL is 40. No, wait, not 40, 50. No, 25. Sorry. Um, so L over P, um, P over L is 25, right? And let's say that is greater by a lot of margins compared to the rest of all the, uh, all the pieces. We can, might have something of a P to L ratio of something like 20 or 21 or 22, but none of them is good as 25. So let's say, again, for the sake of simplicity, this board's length is 8, right? I'm sorry, 10. If, if, if it's 8, then in that instance, it's very clear that you actually get that as the optimal. But let's say it's, it's 10, right? And so, uh, so yeah, so now you sort of take this chunk off, right? And you're left with a unit of 2. But it might be the case that the price of 2 and the price of 1 is absolutely worthless. It's garbage, right? So we're going to, for fun, say that there's zero each. What might be a better way to sort of combine these two, right, is to uh, have, um, have this piece of 5 have a value of 101. Or, to make the math easier, 105. Right? And for that, you get um, P over L of 21. Right? So in the greedy approach, it wouldn't ask you to make two chunks of five. But that is, in fact, the best way to split this piece of wood. Because 105 plus 105 is 210, and just eight and two zeros is obviously <clears throat> obviously uh, just 200. So as you can see, the greedy approach clearly fails here. So what would be the dynamic programming approach look like? Um, does anyone have been, has anyone seen this problem before? And Okay, um, so the dynamic programming problem is, again, this notion of uh, pre-compute and store the information, right? And, it, this, and I guess one useful concept that sort of falls out of uh, dynamic programming, not an intrinsic part of dynamic programming, but a very uh, convenient part of dynamic programming is this notion of working with smaller bits, because smaller bits tend to give you solutions for larger bits, right? So, so we can say, okay, if we had a piece of wood size one, right, what would be the best price? Be? What was the maximum profit you can get for, oh, sorry, let me read all that. This is what we want to get to, size one, right? The best we can do is whatever P1 happens to be, right? And so we can say the best thing we can get for P1 is just, is just one. So then the next question is, what's the thing you can get for uh, 2, right? <clears throat> um, for 2, uh, you can actually, uh, so the, how, how would you calculate for just 2? The value of the previous order. It's like the max of the two options. Uh, what are, uh, so um, well, the max of two options, what are the two options? The first one which you know. Mm -hmm. Or you could take the right one out as one of two options here. So you just based off the previous one, like two sub i minus one. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So two sub i would be like the max of two sub i minus one. Two sub i. Yeah. So there's only two options of splitting a board up with two, right? Mm -hmm. You can keep two and take p of two, right? Or figure out what p of i, right? Yes. P of one. Sorry. P of one is. And so you can just be two ones or one two, and just make that comparison. So in this instance, you go, you get. Um, in fact, instead of calling it P, right? Let's let's create a new array called B, which is the best. Um, I'm sort of falling off the screen. Sorry, um, uh, I'm doing a recording here. Um, so, so we're going to create an array B, which is sort of the best values that you can get up until a certain point, right? And so, extend that down. Obviously, when we, as we said before, it, it's one, right? And so we can take b, uh, b of 1, is equal to p of 1. For 2, we actually just have to make a comparison, right? And we compare, um, it's the max. And instead of p of 1, since p of 1 is equal to b of 1, right? We can say the max of p of 2, or, oh, sorry, since it's a max function, comma, B of 1 times 2. Okay? So then, fun question. Um, 
What do we do for three? Okay. And how do we sort of calculate the previous one? Because so, we need to be careful about all the possible combinations that it can get. And you need to sort of take advantage of the pre-existing structure as much as possible. Because if we're going to calculate all the possible divisions, then what would something of length n, how many possible divisions might there be? Mm, not quite. That's a little large. Is it n? It's, it's 2 to the n. And you can think about it as every interval, you can choose to make a cut or not make a cut. Oh, sorry, I guess it's 2 to the n minus 1, right? But you can just say a cut or no cut, and then you have 2 to the n. Of course, that might not be the most efficient, blah, 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 but you can definitely do better than that in terms of calculating this. So uh, so let's, let's, for fun, sort of list out all the ways, right? 2 to the 2 minus 1, right? That's, that's not 3 minus 1. That's not very large. So think about all the ways you can partition, do the pricing for this, for the three. Yeah, sure. Can just count by sure, sure. So you can. Uh, yeah, we already have those values. So you can do a, you can do either p of three, right? Or you can do p of two plus p of one, or we can do p of one plus p of two, or we can do p of one plus p of one plus p of one. Am I missing anything? No. So those are all the possible options, right? And as you can see, it follows quite clearly the, since there's four, two to the three minus one, which is uh, four, right? And that, it gets really ugly for the other ones. But uh, of these three uh, equations, we, we, we kind of we realized that we've sort of already calculated some of these values before, right? Um, so first of all, there's some redundancies here that we sort of need to get rid of. So, so we're going to say that p of 2 plus p of 1 is equal to p of 1 and p of 2, right? So we can, we can say that that's sort of gone, right? But when we make comparisons between these two, which of these two are better? It's the same as the result from d2. Yes, because um, trying to figure out which one is better here, is takes a lot of computation. But we've already figured out which one is better here. And that's what we did right here in storing the value in B2. Right? And so instead of calculating all this, we can sort of just sort of put them together. And now all we have to calculate is uh, P1 plus B2. Instead, in, but instead of P1 for elegance, we should say B1. Right? So we're sort of recombining the best solutions we have for any subsection. B1. But then we need to compare P3 because that's a, that's a new thing that we've never computed or looked at before. right? And so a pattern sort of emerges. And I guess I just wanted to quickly prove to you that, um, um, that this, would, uh, this would actually give you the optimal solution as if you did a max of that. Right? So in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this three portion chunk, right, assume that B1 plus B2, right? is not better than either P1 plus P1 plus P1 or P1 plus P2, right? And if you make that assumption that uh, the best of one plus the best of two is less than P1 plus P2, P1 plus P1, or, writing off the screen, or P1 plus P2, then you can clearly see that one of these values is improperly calculated. Because if these values are properly calculated, then they already would have accounted for these best max functions. Right. So then these values will be wrong for some, some valid partition. I guess another way to think about it is if you can demonstrate that there's a better uh, value that you can get from partitioning it this way from with, that, with at least one cut, then that one cut's value will be better than the best two you have, which contradicts the notion that you already have the best at that point. Does that make sense? Now, now here's, the, uh, here's the trickier case, right? And I guess it's sort of thinking beyond just two variables, because we already have B1 and B2, but what happens if we say, already calculated uh, B1, B2, B3, and let's say we've calculated B4 and B5 and B6, and I guess I haven't told you the details, but we're going to look at B7, right? B5, B6, B7, B7. 
And so actually, let's, yeah, so let's look at how to calculate B7, given that you already know the best of 1 through 6, right? And we can't do this sort of the same approach of sort of listing out all the combinations, because even all the combinations of the Bs are just as hectic as sort of considering all the other possible combinations, right? Um, so just as a quick exercise, we can have 6 and 1, right? We can have 5 and 2. We can have 4 and 3. We can have two threes and a one. We can have lots of twos and a one, right? And th that combination gets really hectic really quickly. But what we want to sort of uh, look at is when we have seven, right? Um, so when we, have, when we have seven portions, we can sort of look at how, um, how sort of the partition could be doled out. And so... Uh, I guess we're going to sort of sort of embark again on the proof by contradiction, right? So by saying that all we have to do is to look at sort of two possible combinations of these, right? So we can say B1, B6, B2, B5, B3, B4 to calculate 7. We don't have to do any of the complex combinations of B3s and B1s, B2s and B1, and so on and so forth, right? And so all you have to do for B7, I guess I'm giving away the punchline to begin with, is to... Uh, compare P7, because obviously the whole thing might be more valuable than any of the subsets, right? And just B1 plus B6, B2 plus B5, B4, B3 plus B4, and all the uh, inverses are sort of pointless to sort of look at. So why, why is that, right? Why do you not have to look at any combination? So let's say, for example, that 3, 3, 2, right? Or no, sorry, 3, 3, 3, 2, 2, 3, 2, 2. Right, is the best combination in terms of P, right? Or B's for that matter, right? But if um, if three two two is the right combination, then this must also be the best combination up to this point, because when we look at B five, it already has accounted for the possibility of that five chunk being split into two and three, right? We already have this four chunk sort of being accounted for in the terms of this two and two. And so if you were to, again, say that there's a better segment here, then the B values must not be right. right. And so, again, we're sort of breaking it down into that section. So, so we sort of keep building this dynamically until we build to N, and then we look for um, what B of N happens to be, and they'll give you the maximum value. But at every single step, right, you have to look back and check all the possible ones it's not like an elegant closed form solution. You literally have to go, is this bigger than the next one? Is this bigger than the next combination? And that's what that's all that's doing down in programming. If I told you that there exists this best item vector for n minus 1 all the way up to n, right? Then you would come up with something similar. If that's all the information that was given to you, I guess it wouldn't be done in programming because you didn't do all the dynamic pre-computation. That's all dynamic programming is, is this pre-computation. And I guess sort of having the inside and know-how to sort of leverage that information. That's just the next step to dynamic programming, if you will. Not even part of dynamic programming. Sort of like combining dynamic programming with problem insight. So any questions about this example? Okay. Again, it, it, it's at every step you're sort of trying all the different combinations. and. At any one point, all you're just trying to do is to do less work than you have done previously. Because doing less work means it's faster and it's good. Um, By doing more work earlier, basically. Doing all the comparisons. I wouldn't say more work earlier, but I mean, I guess it's almost one way you can think about it. I mean, pre computation almost makes it sound like more work, but it's not necessarily more work. Later on, it really pays off. Um, so what he asked was basically, um, just repeating your questions for the uh, camera audience, um, if pre-computation or dynamic programming means more work earlier on to save work in, in later on, in a lot of instances that might be true, but that's not necessarily true. Because even in the, because there be, there's, there's instances where dynamic programming lends itself to a very pretty way that sort of is just as much work as if you've done the brute force way in terms of the additional computation that you may or may not have needed. So oftentimes, like, yes, you do create an array, you do put the values in, but that's not a necessary property of it. I see. So for Warsaw, one of those examples where it might just turn out very nicely, 
Yeah, it just might be an exa yeah one of those examples that turns uh, turns out very nicely. Not magic. Not quite magic, but I mean it's just, it's not necessary for there to be more work to begin with. Dynamic programming is um, a considered in general, and again, not necessarily. These are all generalizations here, right? In general, they're, they take a little more overhead in terms of programming. For example, the Fibonacci sequence, if you wrote, the, wrote out the recursive function, very simple, very elegant, very quick. But if you wanted to write out the uh, dynamic programming solution, you have to initialize an array, and then you have to keep track of the array values and make sure the indices are right. And this is just a minor overhead in terms of sort of trying to get you there towards uh, what you're looking for. So now we're going to work on uh, one of the problems that happens to be in the Southeast regionals, right? One of the problems that not all teams got, and I think a lot of teams struggled with. Um, I believe some of you in, the, in this class have seen it before. It was the first problem in the Southeast regionals. I'm sort of going to sort of sort of dumb down the problem in order to sort of make it easier for a, um, to sort of explain. Not sort of dumb down because I don't think you guys can handle it. Just because, uh, like, I think going through all the details would go beyond the scope of what I'm trying to teach. Um, so the basic problem is you are on a racetrack, you are a car, and you, the racetrack has lanes, right? And then there's turns, and basically what it's asking you to do is find the shortest path from the start line to the finish line, and you have like a fixed spot that you start in the starting line, but you can finish in any of the lanes you want for the finish line. Um, and so basically, you're, you're trying to figure out the best way to get there. Um, you can't, ch you, you, um, one of the restrictions is, as you're going into a lane, right, a, a turn, sorry, you have to be fixed in a lane, right? But in the stretch, you can sort of waver and do anything you want. And so, um, and so yeah, this is just basically a shortest path problem with certain kinds of constraints, right? And as I've mentioned before, all shortest path problem is, most shortest path problem algorithms are dynamic programming algorithms. Right? You pre-compute the previous set and you sort of figure out the next set. Right? Um, so the way you solve this is very simple. And again, you leverage just dynamic programming. All you have to do right, is to uh, keep track of a sort of a lane um, array right? that sort of keeps the, uh, the array and then you just basically iterate through the number of junctions that there happens to be from start to finish. Okay? And so we begin by saying that the, uh, the uh, you can say have an array of ints, array of doubles, because these are, uh, these are things that you sort of need to calculate. Right? So an array of doubles. A plane. Right? equals to new double. So, and let's say they are um, uh, k junctions. And let's say they're um, d lanes, right? So we just need to calculate from 0 to k. Sorry, no, 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 d lanes. So just d, right? And then we run through a for loop. Less than k and plus plus, and then we create a new a new lane to our, to calculate the new lanes. Actually, we need we need some kind of variable like um, is turn, and we're going to say that to sort of figure out if we're in a turning lane or if we're not in a turning lane, right? And um, is turn. Um, if it is turn, right, all you do is just take this lane array, calculate sort of the arc, the quarter arc that you need to turn, and you just add it to it. So you just say lane. And let's just for a second pretend that you can quickly add arrays together like this, like vectors. Right? Um, just basically say lane plus uh, respective arc. But I guess that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is if it's not a turn, how do you calculate the shortest path? Because you're sort of fixed from this point. You go here, here, and here. But notice in this stretch, right, because you can change lanes, you can go here, you can go here, you can go here, right? And that's all this part is doing, 
as elegant as dynamic programming is, all it is is just calculate all the possible combinations and keeping the best here, right? So we have, um, uh, so if it is not turn, right? If um, bang is turn, right? And then so basically you calculate this length, right, to each of them, and you just say you just create a new new array, right? So you sort of keep the new values, so you don't sort of write over the old values. So double template equals to uh, ah, right. yeah, equals to new double d. And I'm going to start writing over here because I'm kind of running out of the room. Um, and I don't like kneeling down. Um, so new, do new double d, right? And then the next lane is to basically run a for loop again inside all the inside all the lanes, right? And to check um, what's the best way to get here, right? You can either go through this lane, this lane, or that lane. And so. Uh, Good market, right? You can say to get to here, I could either go from this point, go from this point, or go from this point, right? And uh, so basically, you just run the for loop. Um, the new lane value, right? So temp lane. Uh, temp lane equals to the max of all the old lanes, right? So I guess you want to sort of keep the max value on the outside, right? So the temp lane equals to uh, uh, equals to max, right? And, and uh, of uh, the current temp lane, sorry, the min. Apologize, since you're trying to find the shortest path. And I guess one quick here is just to set all the temp lane variables. With the max value, right? So you can sort of do the uh, sort of the algorithmic cheat, if you will. You could you could use logic and stuff like that, but I'm just gonna quickly and it's a cheap, dirty trick to sort of sort of fill this with really impossibly high values. So you sort of never pick that value. Again, it's a very programming hack. Uh, in real world, it could get you into trouble, and has sort of in the past. People try to use these um, fixed variables, and suddenly a value might appear larger than that and causes an explosion. Um, for example, one of the space shuttles actually famously exploded because a person, uh, because the engineers didn't think that the velocity, um, instantaneous velocity calculator, could ever reach that high, and it sort of overfilled, and somehow a computation error led to the whole thing exploding. Not too sure how, but I mean, like that's from a computer science aspect, that's how it happened. So yeah, don't don't do this in industry. But this is great for programming challenge, programming contests. And so from here, you can just say to the max of the min of temp lane, and uh, lane j plus computed value of that length, right? Um, computed value of the length. And at the end of this, just replace uh, lane with template, just repeat, right? And then the last step is to pick the smallest value between all the lane values. See how easy this was this to code? Wow. Yeah. It's not, it's not all. Yeah, and not, every, not everybody solved this problem. A lot of people had trouble solving this problem. Um, and I guess it's just, I, I think people are just put off by the, by the notion of recombination and being able to see the, uh, uh, Yes, but I mean, I, there's some mathy details that I hid from you, right? Like how to calculate the arc of the circle and how to calculate these values. And there were some other constraints to the problems as well, but there were minor constraints. There were nothing that like basic logic variables couldn't have been able to handle. And so, yeah. Um, so our, our hopes and goals is to be able to, you know, make everyone masters of dynamic programming eventually or, or something. So, yeah.
very, very quick and simple program. Um, not a lot of teams are able to solve it, which is a little unfortunate. And I guess the thing about, uh, I guess I guess a slight, uh, inter not intermission, um, slight point to talk about, sort of that isn't talked about enough, is how to recognize a dynamic programming problem, how to recognize a brute force problem, and how to recognize sort of a greedy problem, right? And so um, when we look at greedy, and when we look at dynamic programming, and when we look at um, other problems, there's 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 almost like a good sense or feel of the runtime. For all, a lot of these programming contests, they give you the runtime of like the parameters. They'll say that variables can't get larger than this, solutions can't be larger than that, and we only give you give you n variables. If n is really really large, then chances are most dynamic programming solutions will be a sort of an n log n or n squared solution as opposed to a linear time solution. That might be a hint or a tip-off that you might be looking for something like that. If n is really, really small, right, like less than 100 small, you can almost do a brute force solution. I, 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 100 is too big, right? If you do, it's like 20 small, then you can do almost, you can do a brute force solution to that. Uh, I think greedy is one of the weird ones where it actually has a lot of overlap between dynamic programming and, uh, uh, and yeah, they have a lot of uh, overlap between the two. And they're almost the same. Um, the difference is uh, something known as uh, overlapping subspaces. I won't sort of go into that into detail. But the basic general idea is dynamic programming is very straightforward. I'm uh, sorry, sorry. Greedy is very sort of single direction, if you will, right? It never compares multiple different sets of values. Like, for example, in the stick example or even in the lane example, we sort of had to, at each step, sort of compare the best possible values that we've gotten at this time. A greedy solution wouldn't do that. It would just say, this is the direction towards it, and just build one, build, build, four, and build more and more, right? Um, the, again, the division is very subtle. It's not really clear. And there's a lot of problems that you can easily call dynamic programming or easily call greedy. For example, that racetrack problem, I have a friend of mine, really smart guy. He thought it was a greedy problem because it was sort of a straightforward linear way, even though there's sort of, you have to recompute the subspaces over and over again. So again, both of our both of the ways looking at it is kind of valid. It's sort of an artificially named construct. But I guess back to the point on greedy problems is that um, greedy problems are generally linear because there's that one directional. So you can sort of use the sizes of the problem to sort of tip you off as to what kind of algorithm that they're kind of looking for. But I guess in real life, you just sort of need to. Um, there's proofs for doing it. It's not they're not straightforward proofs for figuring out whether or not a greedy solution works. But it's all really just math based. Um, and we won't cover it in this lecture, but if you're interested, you can definitely go and look online and they'll have descriptions of that. Uh, Christian, you had to ask a question? So if we were to solve the lane question as through a greedy algorithm, it would just do it like um, I'll look at the first lane. It, this is the best thing I've seen so far. And then just keep comparing all the lanes to the best one. And if we find one better, oh, this one's better. And then just keep doing that. Uh, try to get something off of it. Are you talking about the previous uh, yeah, program problem? Like, I mean, I, 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 I mean, so he didn't solve it. I would call that a dynamic programming solution, the one I gave. Yeah. He would call the exact same solution a greedy mm -hmm. algorithm. It's not that he had a different algorithm to solve that question, right? He would just simply have called it greedy because it was sort of, because you only, ha you only move in a singular direction and because D just happened to be really small. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, right, and so I just wanted to uh, um, use that as cues and tip offs. Um, we're going to go through some more uh, dynamic programming problems, I guess, um, unless you guys have any questions. So, uh, so, I guess another sort of, this one's actually a lot more relevant to industry, um, is this notion of uh, matrix multiplication, right? Um, we, when we, we sometimes multiply a lot of matrices, and let's call them uh, A's, right? Um, a of one, a of two, a of three, a of four, a of five, and if you know when you think about multi matrix multiplication, um, they they take quite a bit of time. But and also another thing about matrix multiplication is you can do them in whatever order you like. Okay, you can do these two first, that those two first, that those two first, and I guess the additional interesting thing is that um, they actually. Um, uh, 
is that the order in which you multiply can actually affect the uh, the rate of um, the the total number of multiplications you have to do, right? And the reason is because when you have a really sort of one dimensionally really high matrix here and low dimension here, then when you multiply that over, you're only keeping the values on the outside. So so if you multiply an a um, a by b uh, a by b matrix and you multiply that with a b by c matrix, the resulting matrix is a by b. And sort of that value, uh, you sort of just disappears. Hmm? A by C. Sorry, yeah, A by C. Like that. And so the B value on the inside disappears. Um, again, if you don't know what matrix multiplication is, um, we're just going to tell you that this fact is a given, right? And then and sort of the total number of computations that you have to do here is um, A times B times C. Um, but again, so since this disappears, we want to optimize this, right? So, how are we going to look at this problem? Um, does anyone have any uh, suggestions? Hmm? Uh, so, he's mentioning something about fast forward transfers, uh, transforms. Uh, I wouldn't go with that approach, especially for this lecture. Yes? Right. Well, how are we going to do that? All the way down and build up from small sets of like one. Yeah. And or, then or, you just take the best from those sets and combine them with yep. the best of sets. And yep. The ugly way of just breaking yeah. them up every way you can. Um, so I guess the one, uh, the, um, yeah, so I mean, like, how break them up into two sets, how? Break them up into two sets however you want. Right? And you, if it's true. It's, it has a very tree like structure. You can just start denoting things as the last possible cuts, or the first cut that you make, right? Sort of the first, sorry, instead of cut, multiplications, right? So you can say, um, what is the cost if I do this first, right? Now, the only tricky thing about this case, as opposed to uh, previous cases, right, is that you actually have to um, continue to store new values for sets of things, right? Because the values of the matrix sort of change. Right, so you have to sort of dynamically keep track of that. But, um, and so what you end up needing to keep track of is sort of a two-dimensional array as opposed to a linear array because of the fact that you need to keep track of the new sets of things and how they look like. Right. Um, so, um, because remember, since how you arrive at a solution depends on the order you do it internally, you sort of have to, in some sense, almost keep track of that, um, the shadow of how you've done it internally prior to that point. So you have these sets, right? And, but instead of sort of uh, sort of storing them as these matrices, it's kind of ugly, right? What we are going to do to simplify it is to store them in A's, little A's of 0, A of 1, A of 2, A of 3, and so on. So that A of 1 is A of 0 by A of 1, um, A of 2 is A of 1 by A of 2, and so on. Since, again, I think I mentioned this, but just to reemphasize the point, you can only multiply two matrices if, um, if the, um, I guess, if, if it's A by 0, if A by B, B by C, if those two B values are the same. You cannot multiply them if those two internal values are different. Right? So you can actually sort of use just one number to keep track of all of them. And so when you have N matrices, you have N plus one different uh, values that you need to consider. Right? And so, um, yeah. And so, I, so the first step, right, is to say, uh, what happened if I wanted to just calculate this chunk, right? And so just um, calculate, and you, you, you sort of want to store them in a range. So you want to say, um, uh, value of uh, 0 to 2, right? Um, so zero to one, so zero to one, right, is zero computations. So this this basically says we're going to figure out the best computation possible from from zero, right, all the way out to as far as we can, right. Now obviously from zero to one, it's just this matrix. You don't need to do any computation. So now we do zero to two, right, and that's basically. Uh, a of 0 times A of 1 times A of 2, as we said before, right? 
But then figure out a of 3, right? You can't just do this and this, because then you have to consider this section. And that's why there needs to be a two-dimensional aspect of it, right? So now you also need to calculate 1 to 3 in order to be able to calculate from 0 to 3, right? So again, uh, let's take one step back and reel this back a bit. Um, if we have three matrices in a row, right? We have four different values from 0 to 8 to 3, right? In order to figure out all the different possible partitions, because again, it really is sort of a brute forcey way with the intelligence of being able to pre-compute everything. Um, we can have a1, a2 do it first, right? Or a2, a3 do it first, right? And then multiply by the remaining portions of one another. This is different than the stick example, because the stick example is uniform all throughout. So you can say that um, the 2, 1 division, right? is the same thing as a 1, 2 division. You can't say that for matrices because, again, this computation then this, or this computation then this, makes a difference in terms of how you calculate everything. But since there is a pre-prescribed order, all you have to do is, again, sort of keep track of which ones you're uh, multiplying first. Right. So again, you just need to keep track of a two-dimensional matrix. In fact, actually, the better way to do it, instead of 0, 1, and 2 from this aspect, is just to actually do it from the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, aspect here, right? And I apologize, um, because this is 1 to n, right? Then all you need to keep track of 0 to n plus 1. Uh, sorry, to 0 to n instead of 0 to n plus 1. Because there's only 1 to n, right? Which is less than, it's just 1 less than 0 to n, because you have the additional 0 variable there. So just, so you say um, best, right? And basically finding the best of the entire from um, so the solution is going to be located after we're all said and done in 0 to n. That's where the solution is going to be. And then we're just going to build up to there, right? We're going to say, we're going to calculate the best, oh, no, sorry, 1 to n, right? Because we're keeping track of all the matrices. Again, these are sort of subtle things that you're starting to keep track of. And uh, everyone's eating pizza, and I'm not, so I'm kind of sort of starving here, and so a little blood sugar and excuses. So, uh, <laughs> right. so uh, 1 to 2, right? is equals to a of um, a of 0 times a of 1 times a of 2. And then we want to calculate best 2, 3, right? Equals to um, a of 1 times a of 2 times a of 3. Now to calculate, now that we have these two aspects of here, over here, right? Well, the next big way to calculate best of 1 to 3 is to basically just try out the two different combinations, right? And figure out what's best. So we um, so what we have to do is basically say max, sorry, min, because we're trying to minimize. Um, low blood sugar again. Um, min of all the computations that we did beforehand, so best of one, two, right? Plus the new variables that we have here. So if we're assuming that we already did 1, 2 first, right, then what the matrix we have remaining is an A0, A2 matrix, and this value disappears, right? So it's A0, A2, A3. Right? But then we need to compare it to comma best again of, um, of 2, 3. Assume that's done first, right? So it's best of... Uh, Two, three, plus uh, a zero, a one, a three, and as you imagine, right? As you sort of build this out larger and larger and larger, um, we're going to uh, get all these different kinds of combinations. Now, as, again, as I said before, right? The the magic in sort of the way you can sort of divide everything is um, is the fact that once you go out to seven or eight or whatever, right? Because you keep sort of splitting them up and we have this notion of first or second multiplication. When we start doing chains of uh, a, say, a1 to a7, you don't need to keep track of 3, 2, 2 or 3, 3, 1. Because again, if we're going to say that this division is best, right? Then um, having done this multiplication here, like so, so it's, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's sort of senseless to say that there's going to be the last three sets of multiplications done together, right? Because there's going to be one that has to precede the other, and that's going to affect the total solution. Right? And because there's this nice ordering aspect to it, 
when you say that, okay, now now the final solution is three, three, two, or for eight, let's say, for, uh, sorry, for, for seven, three, two, two, three, right? Then we have to say, well, if we do this one first, then we're simply already calculating this group of five that we already sort of pre-computed when we did all this sort of, sort of fancy magic, if you will, up here, right? Or if we say that this is this has to happen first, right? Then we've already calculated from one to four, right? And so we don't have to do one to two and two to four and then calculate all the combinations over and over again, right? And so again, just exploit that fact of how you don't have to do all these kind of recomputations. And so this runtime, right? So again, it's just redo everything, chug everything over and over and over again. Just be smart about how you sort of do things over and over and over again with new values. Um, so yeah, um, this is an NQ algorithm given the number of matrices. And given that these matrices could be on the orders of thousands of um, variables, and that's a lot of multiplications, um, you can save significantly the amount of computation you have to do um, just by uh, sort of figuring this out. Is it multiplication in NQ already? Hmm? So like the actual multiplication yeah. of two matrices in NQ? Well, um, it's weird to say NQ because it's, it's always a function of the length. And also you sort of can't say how big or large and how much you can save. But we, we can sort of generally say that um, the number of matrices we have here will be much smaller than the sum of all the uh, dimensions, the sizes of these, right? Because if it's a, it's a thousand by thousand matrix, and this alone is already a thousand times, right? The um, sort of just this one matrix by itself. So usually when there's like 50 matrices, and all these are thousand by thousand, there's like um, 50,000 variables. And then at every step, we sort of multiply a triplet of them together. And so this explodes really quickly. And so if you can find out the best way and the fastest way to compute all this, you definitely save a lot of time. And this is, in fact, something that's used in this industry a lot. Of course, I don't think you'll be recalculating this because almost all good matrix multiplication uh, packages already does this for you. But it's good to, and good to be knowledgeable about this. So that I does this for you? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I just imagine that they do. I would be very surprised if they don't. Let's put that way. Um, I guess some other uh, famous examples of... Uh, Dynamic programming is just sort of, I guess, uh, sort of close off the session. Um, one of the uh, one of the interesting dynamic programming problems that's used today is to sort of uh, map out um, the you know how they say talk about um, how they're trying to sort of bend in the whole protein folding problem, right? That's a very large and complicated dynamic programming problem. And if you want to think about it, right, um, it's the order in which they fold that matters, right? But you sort of if you want to get to a certain fold. You can already sort of pre-compute all the possible folds that you get to a certain point. And so you don't have to do all that recomputation of doing similar folds over and over again. Right? Any type of tree type structure um, sort of exploits pre-computed values up to a certain point. Right? Because if you want to say, um, so like for example, when you're sort of doing um, when you're doing okay. I mean, doing some kind of uh, analysis for um, for any kind of tree like structure for like graphics or scene graphs or anything like that. Um, you can say you want to start here, right? And if you want to calculate these two values, don't recalculate this path twice. Just do it once, right? And I guess um, again, it is very. It's very simple. It's very simply just find the common trend, find the common element, right? and just don't redo work. So I guess dynamic programming isn't about being extremely elegant, right? It's just an advice to uh, algorith algorithmicians and right, mathematicians to not be stupid in terms of their computation. Because doing things over and over again isn't smart. So uh, yeah, then I think this would conclude the uh, dynamic programming lecture, unless there are any questions um, about anything. All right, well, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much.